Welcome to our intro to the Physics C Mechanics and Physics C Electricity and Magnetism courses. I am reviewing all of the concepts from your previous physics classes that you have probably forgotten. For both classes, I am expecting that you have taken and mastered all the topics in calculus. Of course, if you haven't taken a calculus class, haven't mastered it, or you need some review, I have the Calculus BC and AB courses, full walkthroughs, full lectures on the channel here. If at any point you need review, make sure to reference those videos. Position, velocity, and acceleration, okay? You probably are very, very well acquainted with these from your calculus class. If you aren't, I'd suggest you check out Unit 5, Graphical Analysis, the video we have up on the channel. It should be a quick review for those of you who've taken calculus before, but I want to stress very much that the relationship between these three derivatives and integrals are very important to your applications here in physics. So that's my first point. Make sure you have these down packed. Second of all, I want us to practice uh, identifying units. Well, not so much identifying units, but identifying what units tell us about a quantity, okay? So if I'm reading a physics problem, and the physics problem gives me that Jack is running at 18 meters per second, I can see that unit and I can immediately say, oh, I have something divided by something else. Anytime I see something divided by something else in my units, I know this is a rate of change. Specifically, I know this is the derivative of position with respect to time, because I have units of position divided by units of time. The importance of that is we will be exploring uh, rates of change and derivatives that you probably haven't seen before. First of all, uh, a problem that stumped a lot of the kids in my class was a problem in which you were given uh, some honey being added to a surface. And in the problem you were given honey being added to a surface at uh, let's say 0 0.8 kilograms per hour. So this you should immediately look at and say, oh, that's a rate of change. That is a derivative of mass with respect to time. Okay, whenever you see a deriv uh, division bar in your units, it's a derivative. If let's say I'm describing a non-uniform density, it's okay, you don't need to know what that word means yet, but in my non-uniform density, my density increases by 4 kilograms for every meter I get further away from the center, that's a rate of change. That is dm dx. Okay? So the importance here is understanding what units tell you about the quantities you're being told about. So from there, we get into the more novel calculus stuff. The integral of velocity as a function of time with respect to time. We all know that this integral is going to evaluate to our position as a function of time plus some constant c. I can rewrite my velocity as a function of time as the derivative of position with respect to time. We know that. So this integral is also dx dt with respect to time. Our dt's can cancel out and therefore this integral can be rewritten as the integral of dx, which is x. So I want us to understand that manipulation. Not uncommon for us to see integrals in this form, and we need to become familiar with them, okay? If I gave you the integral of dm, you would immediately look at that and say, oh, that's just m. But it's important to notice the subtle difference that we have here, okay? The integral of velocity with respect to time gives me a function. The integral of dx just gives me x quantity. With this integral I get a function, with this integral I get a quantity. So why is that? Okay. This integral is more akin, is more interpreted as just the area under a curve. It's the accumulation of change that you've been studying throughout calculus. It's the, it's the integral you're used to. This integral, however, is uh, better used, better defined, better associated with an infinite summation, okay? That is the alternate definition of the integral that many people often overlook, that the integral is an infinite continuous sum. What this integral is telling us is that if I have an infinite amount of infinitely small changes in position, the integral takes the sum of 
all of those infinitely small changes in position, okay? And it sums up infinitely many of them. So that produces my complete finite value x, all right? It is a lot easier to interpret what I'm trying to say in the context of this integral. This integral is, says I am taking an infinite sum of infinitely small masses. Let's say I have a cube of wood, okay? If I wanted to calculate the total mass of the wood right here, I would sum up all of the different uh, infinitely small masses that comprise the block of wood. The infinite sum of all my atoms would give me the total mass of the block that I'm dealing with, okay? And that's uh, the other application that we're going to see of integrals. Uh, that brings me to my discussion of the very, very important concept in physics, which was not covered in your calculus course, the differential. Okay, in your calculus course, you probably made an integral like this, the integral of dx dt with respect to time, and you just said, let's just tack the dt on there, because we have to do that. And we're not exactly understanding what the dt is, okay? A dt, or a dm, or a dx, is what's called a differential. And an understanding of the differential is going to uh, make the calculus much, much easier for you in this class, okay? A differential is just an infinitely small section of something. So a dm is an infinitely small mass, a dt is an infinitely small time, a dx is an infinitely small distance, okay? So if I sum up an infinite amount of those, you can see why that gets me my total mass, my total distance, my total time. Uh, that is going to allow us to gain a much uh, better understanding of the derivative. If, let's say, I have dx by dt, that is an infinitely small change in x divided by an infinitely small change in time. This is effectively telling me um, what is the ratio of my uh, distance to my time. If I change my time by an infinitely small amount, how does my distance change in accordance with that? Okay, so it's basically a ratio. If dx by dt is 4, that means my uh, position differential is growing 4 times as fast as my time differential. It's literally a ratio. And once we start looking at it like this, we can understand that dx by dt uh, with respect to time is just dx by dt multiplied by dt. That's what's going on here. It's a multiplication. Okay? And that's why this equivalence is true. All right? In a lot of the equations we're going to be dealing with in this class, we're going to have um, an equation uh, like, let's say, moment of inertia equals the integral of r squared dm. I'm fully aware that you don't know what that means, but what I'm trying to help you understand is that uh, this integral is not to be interpreted as uh, an area under the curve integral. Rather, this integral is to be interpreted as I am taking some quantity r squared in this case, and I am multiplying that quantity by an infinitely small mass. I am multiplying it by the mass differential. So if I am multiplying my r squared by an infinitely small mass, that's going to give me an infinitely small number inside my integral. And once I integrate that, I get my total, my moment of inertia i. So if I were to try and break this down a little for you, r, radius, is not a function of mass, okay? I'm not calculating an area under the curve because the, this is not a function of mass. I am multiplying radius by a mass differential. So the best way to understand the differential is in context is to try and derive our geometric formulas. And let me give you an example, okay? Let's say I want to derive the formula for area of a circle. We know that area of a circle equals pi r squared. Okay? We also know the area, for, uh, we, we also know the formula for circumference of a circle equals 2 pi r. So if I were to draw a circle like this, I've got my center point right here, and we have some radius r. Okay? 
If I were to try and calculate the area of this circle, I might say, let me calculate uh, the area of a bunch of different rings. Okay, so if I calculate the area of this ring, and I add it to the area of this ring, and I add it to the area of this ring, and so on and so forth, until I've added up the area of all the rings, that should give me the total area of the circle. So the question now becomes, how do I calculate the area of each of those rings? Each of those donuts, I guess you could call them. So let's say I were considering this region right here between these two uh, rings. I was trying to calculate this donut's area. That would be the uh, circumference 2 pi r, where r is the radius to my center right here. And that would be multiplied by the distance between the two uh, outer rings, multiplied by some other radius, capital R. Okay, so that would be my radius of my donut right here. Okay, so now let's take the limit as uh, the number of donuts approaches infinity, or rather the thickness of each donut approaches zero. So how would I express that? Well, my capital R here represents the distance between these donuts, so I'm going to take the limit as my capital R uh, approaches zero. As R approaches to zero of R is the dr differential, is the infinitely small R. So once I consider this limit, I'm no longer considering uh, the distance R between them, I'm considering it as an infinitely small distance dr between all my rings so that my thickness is infinitely small, and I have an infinitely large number of rings. So I'm dealing with 2 pi times the radius to the inner ring uh, multiplied by a dr radius between the two rings, okay? If I were to now sum up all of these infinitely small areas, that's what the integral is, it's an infinite sum of 2 pi r dr, and this is a multiplication now, and where am I integrating from? I'm integrating from my when my radius equals zero up to when my radius is the final radius of my shape, okay? So this, therefore, would be 2 pi r squared over 2, equaling the final total area of my shape. This simplifies to area equals pi r squared, which is the same as the commonly accepted formula we, re we use, okay? Now, if we look back here, when we were calculating the area of this infinitely thin ring, that wasn't an area, it was an infinitely small area, okay? So when we integrate one side, we integrate the other, and we get the integral of dA is A equals 2 pi uh, uh, r squared over 2. All right. So I know it might be a little daunting to understand this new interpretation of how we're going to be dealing with the integral. I know. I'm here to help you guys. Uh, if you guys feel troubled, feel free to rewatch the video. If you still need help, you can join the Discord server. I'm always there. I'm always offering my free help to anyone who asks for it. I'll see you guys soon.